In the beginning, God created video games, and this immediately led to people spending way too much time playing them alone in their bedrooms, to the point of creating separate communities solely for people who play games faster than other people. This is the complete history of the speedrunning community. A speedrun is defined as a playthrough, or a recording thereof, of a whole game or a selected part of it performed with the intention of completing it as fast as possible, no matter the cost. Look at this. It's my integrity. I will do anything for my- A record. The statement still stands! To achieve a high level of play, speedrunners often have to reason about the game differently from the way that ordinary players might, instead looking for the most optimal way to make the game's developers suffer from immense insecurities about their self-worth. When looking at the history surrounding any part of gaming culture, we should start at the first game ever created. This of course being Run From Big Horned Beast. This game didn't have much of a speedrun community for a very long time, as it was more of a survival game than anything else. The general objective of players wasn't really to go fast, but rather to just go fast enough. It wasn't about outpacing other players, just surviving longer than them. Think of it as the difference between Mario Kart and Tetris 99, but if Tetris 99 ended with players being impaled by a mammoth. Over time, the community split off into two groups. The first were the more casual players, who continued to play Run From Big Horned Beast in the traditional way. The second was a group of players who wanted to perfect their abilities, practicing individually and then banding together to create and discuss strategies about how to use various weapons and other techniques to make the game easier. These players would later be titled The Completionists, and would go on to create IGN walkthroughs to help newer players suck a little less. While it seemed as though things were progressing nicely after the split, with some of the more veteran players even giving tips to casual players, the schisms would only increase with time. Eventually, a split occurred within the completionist group. Though many continued to work together with others and consider completion of the game to be a group effort, some individuals began to view the game in a different light. They didn't just want to be good at the game, they wanted to be the best. This meant that some players went out of their way to replay the game over and over again, continuously performing the same actions, slowly decreasing the time it took for them to complete runs. However, unlike the completionist group, they constantly compared their own abilities to others, seeking only the pride found in being the fastest. After years of competition and practice, amongst dozens of runners, one man reigned supreme. With a world record of 2 minutes and 11 seconds, runner Billy Mitchell cemented his spot as the definitive fastest run from Bighorned Beast player in the world, and he did so with only a few puncture wounds. However, this would soon be recognized as a blessing in disguise, as one such puncture wound created in Billy what is now known anatomically as a butthole. Fast forward a few years and we now enter into the age of classical antiquity. This period was notable for introducing the Ancient Olympic Games, a set of real-life video games made to mimic the Mario and Sonic Olympic Games. Despite its predecessor being less of a speed game, the Ancient Olympic Games were filled to the brim with races of all kinds. This was when speedrunning began to reach the world stage, becoming mainstream almost overnight. The Olympics specifically held the Sonic Speed Foot Race, in which the winner got the rights to voice act a character in the next 3D Sonic game. Unfortunately, this reward lost its prestige over the years, with the prize eventually being changed to a lifetime supply of chili dogs and methamphetamine. This time period also saw the rise of some of the most popular names in running today. As the games became the center focus of the majority, the community gained such prolific runners and routers as Aristotle, Usain Bolt, and Clint Stevens. Unfortunately, just as the Sonic Speed Foot Races prize diminished in value over time, Clint Stevens' skill diminished after making a trade with the devil, giving it up in exchange for Twitch Primes. After the success of the Olympic runs, it was only natural that the speedrunning community would continue to quickly grow. Several bad puns later. In fact, they soon entered into what was first considered to be the speedrunning renaissance, though many now view it in a much different light. This was, of course, the age of GDQ. For the first time in history, people of all cultures and backgrounds could enjoy watching their favorite streamers in person, up close and personal. Amidst this odorous joy, however, was a darkness that many were afraid to address. 
This darkness was the maladjusted behaviors of both viewers and runners. Boomerang hype? <laughs> hype? So this is the case where getting crabs is a good thing? Yeah. My name is Topa the Mighty. He doesn't actually talk though. So he would never say that in any situation. He makes grunts. <laughs> That's kind of like talking. He could pretend he does. I would really prefer if you would be quiet. This reality happened to also be the catalyst for the creation of what became known as cringe compilations. Videos made by similarly maladjusted individuals who didn't feel like paying for a sub-only chat. Following the renaissance of speedrunning was a terrible and unexpected recession that caught the majority by surprise. The late Middle Ages of speedrunning were marked by difficulties and calamities including famine, plague, and CRT shortages, which significantly diminished the population of gamers willing to speedrun. Between 1347 and 1350, this CRT shortage crippled about a third of runners, who could no longer reliably attempt their 16-star runs, let alone their swag strats. Controversy, heresy, and the schism within the GDQs paralleled the interstate conflict, civil strife, and peasant revolts that occurred in the Twitch chat. Cultural and technological developments, however, transformed speedrunning society, concluding the late Middle Ages and beginning the early modern period of lagless monitors. Once lagless monitors were introduced to the community, speedrunning once again became a national sport considered worthy of bit cheering. With the improvement in technology, speedrunners were now able to stream not just from console capture cards, but from emulators as well. As runs became more widely documented on websites such as speedrun.com, an unnerving trend began to reveal itself. Many people began getting caught cheating, whether it be due to noticeable splicing, incorrect input displays, or improper pizza controls. Some even spent weeks making tool-assisted speedruns, or TASSES for short, and then pretended to have actually completed the run themselves, all for a week of popularity amongst a niche community of antisocial gamers, despite the fact that they could have gotten a similar amount of praise for releasing it as the TASS it in fact was. Because they're so darn stupid! This pitiful degeneracy resulted in the Great Moderation Bill of 97, in which moderators of specific games were told to actually watch the runs that they verified beforehand, a change that was found to decrease fake leaderboard runs by 98.3%. Another result of the increased documentation was an influx of categories being added to the website. These ranged from variations on run requirements, such as 100% runs and glitchless runs, which are also known as casual playthroughs, to meme runs, such as all signs, all cows, and pot percent, to even adding runs for games that no one knew existed, such as the Naruto Gekito Ninja Tyson 4 Any% Percent Team 7 Story Emulator category, a category that no one in their right mind would ever even consider being a part of. With all of these new categories, speedrunners did what they do best, and began to consider other ways they could complete games using methods that weren't ever intended by the developers. This resulted in the creation of the holy grail of speedrunning, the randomizer. No longer were runners forced to practice the exact same motions over and over again just to replay the same game in the exact same way. Now they could practice completing the game using slightly different motions that changed a bit based on the seed. This revolutionized the speedrunning community and introduced speedrunning to millions of gamers who otherwise didn't have the patience to actually develop the skills needed to run games. It also gave a short boost in popularity to figures in the community, most notably Zelda's number one freaky gamer, or ZFG1 for short. ZFG1 is most well known in the Ocarina of Time community for his rivalry with Clint Stevens prior to his deal with the devil. Since then, ZFG1 has established himself as not only the most competent runner of the game, but also the most manly. This has been repeatedly documented through his refusal to simp over such popular e-girls as Pokimane and Simple huh? Flips, instead focusing on his committed relationship with his one true love, Dampe the Gravedigger. 
Speaking of simple flips, he actually was at one point in his life a notable speedrunner as well, before retiring and focusing solely on Tetris Plus tournaments. He was the first man to ever speedrun a Mario 64 ROM hack, which opened the gates for more emulator-based speedrun categories. However, after suffering from immense psychological damage as a result of his Green Demon speedrun challenges, he now refuses to go quick in any game whatsoever. This sad reality is displayed most clearly in his Super Mario Maker 2 videos, where even in multiplayer races, he refuses to use the run button, his mental scars only allowing him to walk and jump. As we enter the late modern era of speedrunning, we see the ways in which speedrunning has influenced the world around us, even outside of our basements. In the world of classical music, we see musicians such as Franz Liszt creating pieces such as Hungarian Rhapsody No. 2, made to mimic the increasing speed of players as they get past the starting tutorials. On the more sacrilegious side, we have people speedrunning already quick songs, such as Ben Lee performing Rimsky-Korsakov's Flight of the Bumblebee, without putting in the necessary 40 hours of practice a day. In addition to this, we also have innovations in modern daily life influenced by speedruns. The idea of going to the end of levels as fast as possible was what inspired the creation of the car. Skipping over levels to reach the goal inspired the creation of the airplane, and resetting after failed attempts inspired the creation of Hinduism. The immense ingenuity of speedrunners has become so apparent to mainstream culture that even major political figures are relying on the mental fortitude and prowess of such big-brained gamers in dealing with real-world issues. So again, I'm going to call on that generation that's part of that group that brought us innovation, particularly throughout all of their ability to look around corners and skip through games. Um, I always went level by level. I didn't realize that you could go from level three to level seven. Um, that's what they've taught us. They look for things that we don't see. We need them. In addition to these more subtle inspirations and ingenuities, speedrunning also led to real life parallels with various life-based categories being created. Here are just a few examples that have been previously documented. <laughs> oh, book. Oh, okay. Oh, we're done. Go. Eight nine nine. That's it. As can plainly be seen, speedrunning has helped shape and cultivate the modern society that we live in today. Speedrunning even had a large impact on the development of games themselves. The head developer of Zelda Majora's Mask, Nintendo Miyamoto, intentionally left references to Super Mario 64 speedrunner Cheese for him to find during his playthroughs, ranging from comical visuals such as a block of cheese on Zelda's sword to entire mask quests centered around dairy ranches and milk bars. These were left unnoticed, however, as Cheese had assumed that Majora's Mask was just an edgy ROM hack of Ocarina of Time, and thus never took the time to play it. This didn't stop Nintendo from continuing to put such references in future titles, however, as Mr. Nintendo went as far as to put cows in Breath of the Wild, in hopes that he could subliminally reach his biggest speedrunning idol. As speedrunning continued to grow and develop, so did the streamers who profited off of the community. One of the most notable examples is Facebook Live streamer Lugwig Anderson Gaming. Known for his various tycoon tactics, the 5'2 man cornered the market on low-level speedrunning by entering the most lucrative of markets, the monkey ball community. Despite having never speedrun a day in his life prior, Lugwig found a way to revolutionize the speedrunning world on his own. Mr. Gaming revealed to the world that you didn't actually need skill to speedrun, or even to follow the routes that professional runners had created previously. He simply put a timer on his casual playthroughs, making himself seem to be a more competent gamer than he truly is by associating himself with a skillful community. In addition to this, he gained thousands of Facebook Live followers because of the underdog story he fabricated. 
by never resetting on what he portrayed to be real runs, he convinced the unaware viewers that he was full of determination, only seeking to finish runs and get better, even though the reality was that he simply didn't know how to restart his splits without closing the program. This deception led to Ludwig Anderson Gaming becoming one of the most popular speedrunning icons, despite the fact that his only race victories have been over an elderly man. When speaking of the history of speedrunning, it's important to look at the in-game discoveries that most affected the communities. For example, Zelda Ocarina of Time speedrunners recently discovered a new strat that allows the 100% route to be as much as an hour faster. This technique is known as Extra Speedy Slip and Slide, or ESS for short. While it may not seem fast, that's simply because it isn't. At least, not on its own. While it's in fact the slowest possible speed Zelda can go on his own, this slowness actually allows him to gain immense speed, just like how Lightning McQueen turning right helps him to go left, a plot point that was derived from this very speedrunning discovery. When combined with a bomb blast and a roll, Zelda goes sliding extremely quickly. This is a version of ESS known as BESS, or the Bomberman Extra Speedy Slip and Slide Technique for short. A name based on both the technique founder ZFG1's ex-wife's middle name, as well as his love of the Bomberman series. While this technique is one of the most well-known in speedrunning history, it's unfortunately only able to be performed by a select few runners. This is because, as stated earlier, the ESS position to start the best is the slowest possible speed, meaning it needs the absolute smallest control stick motion possible. Setting up even a single best requires the use of the Wuxi finger hold, an amount of precision gained not only from practice, but an innate talent from birth that some people just don't have. Another such example of a revolutionary find in speedrunning can be found in Super Mario 64 runs. Even beyond the game itself skipping 59 Mario titles, there's also the BLJ, or Bended Leg Jerk technique for short. This technique requires the player to bend Mario's legs backwards at an increasing rate so that they jerk with such speed that Mario himself is propelled backwards. The bended leg jerk technique was such an incredible discovery that it not only made zero star runs possible, but also helped physicists figure out that such a principle exists in real life as well. Soon after the BLJ was found, physicists discovered a quantifiable rate at which an object's acceleration changes with respect to time, a unit of measurement which was aptly named jerk after the BLJ. In addition to this, the Lakitu skip at the beginning of the game inspired the real-life concept of dodging the draft. While speedrunning has helped the world around us develop through its innovations and various techniques, there is still a darker side that must be acknowledged. Despite the generally lighthearted, if a little overly competitive nature of gamers playing games quick, there exists a faction of speedrunners that don't abide by normal principles. They aren't cheaters, far from it. However, they seek pathways to records that some consider to be unnatural. This is a dangerous group of individuals, not always free from the fear of technical flubs, yet almost always fueled by their hatred for that which they seek the most. They are the RNG Runners. These individuals intentionally speedrun games that aren't consistent, games that rely heavily on pure, raw luck. Akin to that of an addicted gambler, they keep running endlessly in hopes of achieving the elusive, perfect, one in a million, unbeatable run. One might be quick to ask, why would they do this? Seek a record based not solely on their skill, but almost purely on luck. Is it the dopamine release, or the rush they feel upon reaching their next fix? Or are they reluctantly continuing as slaves to the sunk cost falaki? The uncertainty is what's most unnerving, and each individual runner is at a different point in the cycle. Some are deeper in, and some are simply perpetually worse off than others. Oh my goodness. Great, now I have to hit the- WOW! Unreal. <sighs> As speedrunning continues to grow and develop, it's plain to see that the world is slowly becoming more and more centered around the fast-paced esport. 
It's become so intertwined with our reality that trying to explain modern culture without referencing the high-speed phenomenon that started it all is like trying to explain how playing video games at all is fun without explaining the feeling of success that's felt upon finally getting that star after 12 hours of building up speed. In fact, theoretical physicists predict that it's only a matter of time before the very fabric of our existence becomes dependent on the success of maladjusted men who refuse to do anything beyond once again replaying the first area of Kokiri Forest. The unfortunate reality, however, is that once we've reached such peak optimization, our entire universe will eventually know nothing but red splits. What performance enhancing drugs that I take? You know what the best performance enhancing drug is? Practice.